Hi, and welcome to today's webinar for limb girdle muscular dystrophy. We're so excited today. We have Dr. Peter Kang with us. He's a GRASS LGMD member, and I'll introduce him formally in just a moment. But this is part one of a topic that is of a lot of interest to patients with limb girdle muscular dystrophy. I have limb girdle muscular dystrophy type 2i. And I know from speaking with lots of people that this is an issue that a lot of individuals want advice on. They need a lot of understanding and information. So today's topic is a part one of demystifying genetic test reports for limb girdle muscular dystrophy, understanding boost. And so Dr. Kang will talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Boy, this is going to be a interesting webinar. I'm so excited about it. I've been wanting to do a webinar on this forever. I'm excited about that. I want to also tell you that in addition to the webinar today, on August the 28th, we'll actually do part two of this series on demystifying genetic test reports for LGMD. And Michael Leck will be with us. He's also a GRASP LGMD member an assistant professor at Yale University. Munkle has a strong passion as well for rare disease research, especially with limb girdle, because he also has limb girdle muscular dystrophy type 2G. And so he'll be sharing with us. You can actually sign up for that webinar at thespeakfoundation.com. And I'm excited for you to participate in that one as well in August. So sign up today. We've got it posted already on our website. And we want to let you know about Advocacy Day coming up on September 22nd. And this is LGMD Day on the Hill. What is that? Well, we have to be advocates for ourselves. And this is an advocacy event that will be virtual where we're going to be talking to legislators in Congress. And why would we need to do that? Because there are a lot of topics and issues right now that we are dealing with in the limb girdle muscular dystrophy community. For example, the COVID-19 issues that we had this year is just one issue that we need to make sure we're advocates about. And then also any other issue that's coming up in our community that's important. So the virtual event was gonna be in person, but due to COVID-19, we're gonna do this virtually. So how do you sign up? You're gonna to go to speakfoundation.com and you're gonna sign up through Eventbrite for this free event. The reason why we're gonna to meet together all at noon is because our volunteer director is Ralph Yanez, and he is gonna share with us how to do advocacy. He's gonna go through email templates so that you can send something to your legislator. He's gonna to talk to you about how to do a phone call and the things that we're gonna share with you that are advocacy issues. And he's gonna lay it all out. You're gonna have downloadables that you can easily connect and just advocate for yourself. So uh, we're gonna also be giving away two mobility scooters, which is wonderful. So if you're living in the USA, you can participate in that giveaway at the 12 p.m. event virtually. So I wanted to let you know about that. And then we also wanted to say thank you to our sponsor, Sarepta Therapeutics. Sarepta Therapeutics has brought together the elements essential for development of gene therapies, productive collaborations, unparalleled scientific understanding, and an unwavering sense of purpose. Sarepta has five limb girdle muscular dystrophy gene therapy programs that are in development, including subtypes for 2E, 2D, 2C, 2B, and 2L and holds an option for a six program in 2A. I wanna let you know about a resource. It's lungirdle.com. This is where you can find out about genetic testing and free genetic testing. And we have links there. Staying connected. If you're a resident of the US and you wish to stay updated in Sarepta's work, please sign up at the website and then you can connect with Sarepta's patient affairs team. And the email there is advocacy at sarepta.com. We will also send you an email if you've pre-registered for the webinar with this information in it. At this time, I wanna go ahead and introduce formally Dr. Peter Kane. 
He is chief of the division of pediatric neurology and professor of pediatrics at the University of Florida College of Medicine with joint appointments in the Department of Neurology and the Department of Molecular Genetics and Microbiology. His laboratory studies, the genetic origins, Denise mechanisms, and therapeutic strategies for muscular dystrophy. He has published extensively on these subjects and has been awarded grants from the NIH, MDA, and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. So Dr. Peter Kang, welcome. And I see you've already got your slide deck up and we're excited to hear what you have to present. Thank you very much, Catherine, uh, for the invitation to speak today. Uh, it's a great pleasure being here. And we'll begin um, talking about uh, demystifying limb girdle muscular dystrophy genetic test reports. And this uh, is sponsored by the Speak Foundation. So uh, I have a relationship with Avexis Novartis, and, uh, but, which is not really relevant to today's talk. Um, I won't be discussing names of specific genetic test companies or brand names or companies to make this uh, talk balanced. And so, so that's why you won't see any of the, that information uh, as part of this presentation. So uh, we're gonna go through a few topics and questions. Um, one is just basics of inherited neuromuscular disease. Uh, the second is why bother finding the mutations? And for some people, it's, um, it's uh, sort of um, a given, but for others it's not. So I wanna make sure I address this issue and make sure everybody's on the same page. And then there's all kinds of genetic testing available these days, and I'd like to go through that a little bit. And the big question is what to do with a VOUS. And um, a lot of you know what a VOUS is or have heard of it, but I'll explain that more later. And then we'll wrap up with some take home points. So let's start with some basics. So this is a, a, a picture uh, that was made from a photograph in the mid 19th century by Dr. Duchenne, who described Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And the reason I show it is to, to illustrate how even that long ago, a lot of the key clinical features of some of these diseases were well described. And so you can see some of the issues with the muscle bulk and the posture that appear in this disease and other muscular dystrophies. Another um, early finding that's still useful today as well is what we call the Gower sign. And some of you may have be familiar with it from discussions with your own physicians. Uh, but this is a strategy for somebody who has a lot of hip girdle weakness and thigh weakness to get up off the ground. And because of uh, Dr. Gower's was the first to describe it, it's called the Gower sign even today. So um, before we go on the genetic testing, it's helpful to discuss some background information about these diseases. It's really important to have a solid clinical evaluation to put genetic testing in context. In a lot of cases, a thorough physical examination by a neurologist can be helpful. And one thing about neurologists like myself is we like to localize lesions first at, when we think about a disease workup. And that means what part of the nervous system is affected. And one question that we often uh, are faced with is when somebody has symptoms, is it coming from the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system? And by central nervous system, I mean brain and spinal cord. And peripheral nervous system is part of the spinal cord as well as nerves and muscles. In infants, especially those at low muscle tone, it can be really hard to distinguish between those two, central versus peripheral nervous system problems. So as we all know, um, as we'll be talking primarily about muscle problems, we're gonna focus in on peripheral nervous system disease. So within peripheral nervous system diseases, there are four basic categories if you think about the anatomy. There's the motor neuron, which is where the body of the nerve cell is in the spinal cord. There's the nerve that goes out from the spinal cord to the muscle. There's the neuromuscular junction, and that's the connection between the nerve and the muscle. And you might not think that it's a very active site, but it's actually a very important part of this whole um, network. And then there's the muscle itself. So these are just some examples of diseases that go along with each part of this peripheral nervous system. And I underline limb girdle muscular dystrophy on the right because obviously that's what we're most interested in today. But I wanna put this in context. So when you go through an evaluation and you're having trouble walking, for example, um, 
one of the first things is to figure out what part of the nervous system is it peripheral or central and then once you settled on peripheral you have to figure out what part of that peripheral system is it and then if it's muscle there's a whole bunch of different diseases associated with muscle so um, so it is sometimes a little bit um, difficult to go through this workup and find the actual diagnosis once in a while it's sometimes it's really fairly evident early on. Other times, unfortunately, patients do go on this long odyssey of looking for what the diagnosis is. So um, some of the resources for neuromuscular evaluations are first, if we talk about the people involved, it's often helpful to have a neurologist um, by your side. And that can be either an adult or pediatric neurologist, depending on the age of the patient. Geneticists are extremely knowledgeable and skilled, and depending on the situation, they may be involved in the diagnostic evaluation also. Genetic counselors are very useful. Um, they're very talented, um, and I've worked with them for many years, and I find them to be indispensable. When it comes to actual tests, there are basic clinical laboratory tests. A lot of you um, if your patients have had CK levels checked to see if the muscles are uh, leaking enzymes out. Um, there are also other enzymes that can be found in muscle, including aldolase, ALT, AST, and LDH, but the creatine kinase to CK is the most important significant one um, that we look at. Uh, having access to an EMG laboratory, that's electromyography, is very important. And uh, it's not as critical for a lot of muscle diseases, but sometimes it's hard to tell at the beginning whether you have a muscle or a nerve problem. So that's where an EMG can come in handy. Um, these days, more and more patients are going through muscle and nerve ultrasounds and MRIs. And when those facilities are available, that can also be very helpful for the diagnostic evaluation. Muscle and nerve biopsies have been around for a long time, and that's one of the traditional ways of trying to figure out what's going on with a patient. Um, I still uh, request muscle and nerve biopsies semi-regularly, I'd say once every month or two. Um, it used to be much more often. Uh, some neurologists do their own biopsies, especially for adults. Uh, in children, my experience is that surgeons typically do the biopsies and the children often do better under general anesthesia, so it's just a better, better setup for them. It is helpful to have a pathology laboratory and a pathologist, that's a doctor who specializes in uh, looking at these types of biopsies, who can process and interpret these studies. And then there's genetic testing, which is what we're most interested in today. And th this is done at various facilities around the country, and it's an extremely useful tool. And, and in a lot of cases, it can give you an answer uh, that's fairly definitive. Now for CK levels in particular, I put up these tables that show what the ranges are and elevations in CK. And you'll see this abbreviation ULN scattered all throughout. ULN stands for upper limit of normal because different laboratories have different uh, ranges of what's considered normal. Instead of having actual num numerical values that you may have seen in your own laboratory reports, uh, these um, articles that I got this information from have um, listed the, um, the number of times the upper limit of normal that they see. And so you can see with different types of limb girdles, sometimes you can even see normal CK levels. Others are almost always elevated. So there's a lot of variability depending on the subtype. So you might wonder why, why, what is the point of finding the mutations? And that's a question, fortunately I don't hear as much these days, but 10, 20 years ago, um, that was a question that was asked a little bit more often. So I just want to make sure we go through and understand why we're looking for these. One question is, are we sure it's LGMD? Um, LGMD can be suspected when you examine a patient and hear their story, but, um, but there are other things that could look like LGMD. Uh, one of the obvious things is other muscular dystrophies. Uh, Becker muscular dystrophy in particular has a lot of overlap with limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So it's helpful to know whether you're dealing with Becker or limb girdle. And there's a rare type of muscular dystrophy called Emery dreyfus, which also can look a bit like limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Now, there are some diseases that are not muscular dystrophy at all, um, but they can look like limb girdle dystrophy. One is spinal muscular atrophy type 3, another is Pompe disease, and a last is a um, specific subtype of congenital myasthenic syndrome, which is quite rare. And what I've listed on the slide after the names of these disorders are the therapies that are available. 
And so all of these diseases have therapies. They're not always cures, but they do help with the symptoms. So it is consequential to figure out what your diagnosis is. Uh, even if it's a genetic diagnosis, there may be some uh, treatments available today and there'll be more in the future. Another reason to figure out what your mutation is or your genetic diagnosis is so that you can benefit from genetic counseling and family planning. You want to know what are the consequences of a genetic diagnosis. Um, there are some concerns that some people have and sometimes unfortunately it is um, uh, founded uh, of uh, genetic discrimination. That's where an insurance company or an employer may discriminate against you because of a genetic um, diagnosis. There is a Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. It's been around for, um, uh, for a couple of decades now. It doesn't protect you from all types of discrimination, but it offers some protection. So it's something to keep in mind uh, when you get this testing done. Other questions you might have is, um, are, are your parents a carrier if you have the disease? And your parents might want to know, are both parents carriers? What is the risk of recurrence? Uh, for someone who has a child who has a muscular dystrophy, one thing that they would really want to know is what are the what's the likelihood of having another child is affected? And, and paired with that is the question, what are the options for having future children while minimizing recurrence risks? Another reason you want to know your diagnosis is to have coverage for supportive therapies. And these can include physical and occupational therapy, orthoses, uh, other, otherwise known as braces, and other durable medical equipment. And the last reason to get a di genetic diagnosis is that there are new treatments that are coming out. So we're not focusing on either spinal muscular atrophy or Duchenne today, but there's been a lot of news and press about these two diseases because more therapies are coming out. And you can see that the FDA has approved um, two th uh, treatments for each of these diseases in the past few years. And one, one would naturally wonder is, is LGMD next? And I think there's a good chance that there'll be new treatments approved for LGMD in the future. Let's go on to the next section. Genetic testing, there's old fashioned forms and newfangled forms. And, I, and this is a little bit exaggerated because a lot of genetic testing, whether it's old or newfangled is actually relatively new, but, uh, but there are rapid advances happening. So for terminology and genetic test reports, uh, I'll just go over some of the terms you might see when you look at a report. And you should always try to get a copy of your genetic test report, even if it's negative, because that way, other doctors who take care of you if you, um, if you need to see another specialist will have an idea of what's been done already. So a variant, um, you'll see that term a lot. That just means a change in the DNA sequence. A mutation um, is technically a variant that causes disease. So I, I use the term mutation specifically for that reason. Some people use it a little bit more broadly, but I try to be as specific as possible. Some of the other terms you'll see in a report, a pathogenic variant or causative variant, that generally means the same thing. It means a change in DNA that causes disease. And then there's the variant of unknown significance, otherwise known as a VOUS. We'll talk about that more a little bit later, but in that situation, it's not clear whether the DNA change is disease causing. And then there's benign or non-pathogenic, which means that whatever change they, they're flagging in the DNA uh, uh, is not disease causing. So uh, make sure you have somebody who is comfortable with genetics to help you navigate this. It can be a neuromuscular neurologist who is comfortable with genetics. Uh, neuromuscular neurologists are neurologists who've done additional training in neuromuscular medicine. And these days, part of that training does include some genetic background. It can be a pediatric neurologist or an adult neurologist, again, depending on the age of the patient. A geneticist, as I mentioned, can be extremely helpful. This is a physician who has special training in medical genetics. And then there's a genetic counselor who's a healthcare professional with a specialized master's degree and also has passed a certification test. So it's fairly rigorous to become a genetic counselor. And so those, uh, those professionals can be very helpful. Let's go through patterns of inheritance. Now, with respect to limb girdle dystrophy, the first two are the most relevant. So autosomal recessive is the pattern for LGMDR, and that was previously called LGMD2, 
but for various reasons, the terminology is starting to change and the classification system. So for recessive diseases, you need two mutations, one on each copy of the gene to cause disease. And usually these cluster in a single generation or branch of the family, but there are exceptions. And then there are dominant diseases, autosomal dominant. And so those are LGMDDs. Previously that was called LGMD1. Typically you only need one mutation on one copy of the gene to cause disease. And the pattern that you see there is typically vertical transmission, meaning that if you have a patient who's affected, usually they have a parent who's affected, oftentimes a grandparent who's affected, and so it goes up the family tree. Now there are spontaneous mutations that occur. So sometimes you can have a dominant mutation where there's only one patient affected. So that happens as well. I won't really dwell on X-linked recessive or dominant. That's not as relevant. You see X-linked recessive in Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy um, and X-linked dominant is relatively rare. So to also help interpret genetic test reports, it just helps to go over just basic terminology in terms of the genetic code. So genomic DNA, when you give a blood sample or a saliva sample for genetic testing, what, what they extract from those fluids is genomic DNA, and that's your DNA that is in your chromosomes. What happens with that DNA um, in your body is that it's transcribed into pre-messenger RNA, and then that's spliced, meaning that only certain parts of it are important for the protein, and that becomes messenger RNA or mRNA. And then that's translated into proteins. And proteins are just strings of amino acids. That's all that a protein is. Now, I mentioned before that there are variants, meaning sequence changes in DNA. There are different kinds of variants that you can see. One is a nonsense change, and that's where you introduce a stop codon. And that means that you stop making the protein at that point. And a lot of times, that's disease causing. That's a fairly significant change. There's a frame shift which alters the reading frame. It, that means that you alter the um, numer numerous amino acids in the protein, and that's also often disease causing. That's not a good change to happen. The next two are a little bit more ambiguous, and this is where the VOUS has come up. There are structural variants, which include copy number variants. Some of those are disease causing, some of them aren't, and sometimes it's hard to tell. There are missense variants. That means that there's a single change in the DNA sequence and it changes a single amino acid. And sometimes these are disease causing and sometimes they're not. And most, although not all VOUSs that you'll see in uh, genetic test reports are missense variants. And then there are synonymous variants. That means it doesn't alter the amino acid sequence. Usually those don't cause diseases, but in some cases they do. And that's something that we can get into another time um, and as that maybe explain some of the hard to diagnose cases. Uh, there are all kinds of ways to do genetic testing. So when you get a genetic test, it's helpful to know what kind you're getting so that you have an idea of what's being tested. One of the oldest types is a karyotype, and that's still done sometimes today. It's good for chromosomal aneuploidy, such as Down syndrome. Uh, Southern blot and fish analysis are good for looking at large gene deletions and duplications when there are big chunks of DNA that are missing or duplicated. Then there's PCR, um, and then there's Sanger sequencing, which is basically a way to look at the, the DNA sequence in a string. The two newfangled methods that are used a lot by diagnostic labs are chromosomal microarrays, and a lot of you may have had chromosomal microarrays done at some point during your evaluations. Um, then there's also next generation sequencing, <clears throat> which is used pretty commonly these days. So why are there, why is there a new generation of, why is there a new generation of testing? Well, the, the, the fact is it's just, there are just too many genes now. And so the old Sanger sequencing technology was very gene specific and it was very expensive to put together panels where you could test five or 10 genes at a time. And so to target your genetic testing, I remember when I first started practicing, I, I would be requesting muscle biopsies much more frequently just because it was really hard to get a bunch of genes tested at once. This is a, a diagram that shows some of the proteins that have been associated with limb girdle dystrophy and other muscular dystrophies. And for some of you who already have a diagnosis, you may have seen some of these um, terms or may have seen these on genetic test reports. This just illustrates that the proteins involved in limb girdle dystrophy are located all throughout the muscle's fiber and they perform all kinds of important functions for your muscle. 
So the uh, methods for next generation sequencing, the newer form of sequencing, um, there are three of them. There's targeted sequence capture. And when, when, a, uh, when a physician orders a genetic test, that's, uh, for example, a muscular dystrophy panel or a neuropathy panel, something like that, that's typically a targeted sequence capture test. There's whole exome sequencing, which is used more and more uh, these days in clinical practice, and then whole genome sequencing, which is available clinically, but is not used quite as often yet. I expect it will be in future years. So what links all of these sequencing techniques together is that you're making DNA libraries and you're doing a lot of sequencing all at once in parallel. And that's how it becomes more efficient and how it becomes more cost effective. Just to give you an idea, this is the raw data output from, from next generation sequencing. And you can see that little strands of DNA code are scattered everywhere. And you need fairly high powered computer systems to line these up and figure out what the actual DNA sequence is in your cells. So one thing that's really important to know is what's the yield of next generation sequencing? How, what percentage of patients actually get diagnosed? And fortunately that's been studied both by my laboratory and other laboratories. So if you look at inherited neuromuscular disorders and you look at a targeted sequence capture panel, which is a typical clinical panel, um, back in 2015, the, the uh, diagnosis rate was 46%, which is pretty good. Um, more recently, they, um, another group looked at the, um, the yield for limb girdle in particular and found the yield of 27%. And then uh, our group and other groups have looked at, um, at families with limb girdle dystrophy that have not had a diagnosis on clinical testing. So those are the hard to diagnose patients. And when we do exome sequencing, uh, we found and other groups have found that you can get a diagnosis in 40 to 50%, which is pretty good. But what this, what this indicates is that there are a lot of patients who no matter how hard you try right now, you can't find a genetic mutation, even if they look very much like they have limb girdle. So the take home point for this is a negative genetic test does not exclude limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So, uh, Key point, what do you do with a variant of unknown significance? So the abbreviation is VOUS. Some test reports say VUS, it depends on the company. Um, these are most often associated with those missense changes that I told you about earlier. And that's a change in a single amino acid. And what this means is that there's a change in the DNA sequence. It's not clear if this is responsible for the patient's symptoms, but it might be. And it's it can be very frustrating both for uh, the healthcare professionals who are trying to interpret this for you, as well as the patients themselves, because it's not always clear what the next step is. So how do you interpret this? And what is very helpful is to look at the context. So there's um, genotype phenotype correlations, and that, that means is the gene associated with the disease? And I'll explain all these in the subsequent slides. There's co-segregation patterns. How does the combination of variants explain the inheritance? Allele frequency, how common is the variant? Species conservation, is the amino acid found in similar proteins in other species? And then lastly, protein prediction. Do computer programs predict that the protein structure will be affected? So I will go through this uh, relatively quickly, but hopefully thoroughly one by one. Um, I would like to make a note that online resources are key. So ClinVar is a resource that I use a lot, and it's a publicly available database where you can look up various, uh, various uh, uh, findings on genetic tests and see what, um, uh, what the information is. Most genetic test companies already look things up in ClinVar and other resources, so they try to do some of the footwork for you, uh, but the exact um, combination of resources that they look at varies from company to company. So let's go through these um, strategies. So first, the genotype-phenotype correlation, meaning is the gene associated with the disease? So other diagnostic test results can be really helpful to sort this out as well as the medical literature and also the old fashioned uh, physical exam. So if there's a mutation that shows up or possible mutation, uh, let's call it a variant on your genetic test report, but it's only been associated with certain skin diseases and you have a muscle disease, then that makes it a little bit less likely that that's significant. So, so that's a way you can put this finding in context. 
it is also important to look for hidden connections. So some genes are associated with both cardiac disease and muscular dystrophy, and that's an example. So if you have a patient with a muscle disease and you find a change in a gene that's only been reported for heart disease so far, there might actually be a connection. So even though it looks a little less likely, it's not necessarily, some, not necessarily something to be dismissed right away. So the co-segregation pattern, does the combination of variants explain the inheritance pattern? And this is a little bit technical, but uh, I'll go through it and I'm happy to answer questions later. Uh, if the disease is recessive, two mutations should be present for any family members who have the disease, and then the other should have either zero or one copy of the mutations. If it's recessive, each of the two mutations should come from one parent in most cases, and that parent should only have one copy of that change. If the disease is dominant, usually one parent has um, the mutation and the disease, or it could be that there's a spontaneous mutation. So uh, this is just an example of a family tree from a paper we published a while ago. And you can see that uh, black circle in the middle. Uh, that's the patient who's affected. And all the half-filled squares and circles indicate that there are carriers scattered throughout the family. And then the open circles that don't have anything in them um, are patients who don't have, um, don't, aren't known to have uh, uh, either mutation. Uh, a few more things that can be looked at, allele frequency. So how common is this variant if you have it in your genetic test report? And there's a resource ca called NOMAD um, that is very useful to both clinical people and research um, researchers. The, the thing to remember is limb girdle muscular dystrophy is rare. The epidemiologic study suggests it's found in 1.63 to 2.27 per 100,000 population, which means that <clears throat> if you have a million people only about a dozen people in that uh, group of a million uh, are likely to have limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So we use fairly stringent cutoffs. If a variant's present in even 1% of the population, that's actually too common for it to be a likely disease uh, mutation. So the, very, the frequency of, of uh, what we're looking at is very important. And then species conservation. So if you have an amino acid that's uh, changed, um, is it found in similar proteins in other species? So if you have an amino acid change, if, if, if that amino acid is found in frogs and mice, and then it suggests that the amino acid uh, serves an important function. And that, that suggests that it's more likely to be a disease-causing change compared to a non-conserved amino acid. So the last way that uh, we analyze variants of unknown significance are by protein prediction programs. So there are computer programs available online, and I've listed some here, that uh, predict whether the protein structure will be affected by whatever change you plug in. Each program, though, uses a different algorithm based on different assumptions. So when you take a variant from a genetic test report and you enter it into these programs, uh, the results sometimes conflict with each other. One will say that it's probably pathogenic, another one will say it'll, it's benign, and so it can be a little confusing. So uh, some of the take-home points that I'll wrap up with. So let's say your genetic test does give you a diagnosis, uh, and I'm, you know, hopefully that'll be more and more of a frequent occurrence as we get more sophisticated with our genetic testing. When you get that diagnosis, you should definitely ask about prognosis knowing that the information may be fragmentary for some limb girdle subtypes. So some of the less common ones, there have only been a handful of papers published on them, not much is known. So I know it's frustrating, but the, the range of knowledge available is somewhat considerable. Um, it's important to ask about potential complications. Uh, some of the subtypes may be associated with uh, risk of cardiac complications and others uh, it's not been documented. So there are things like that that are important to know about. You do want to ask about the risk of recurrence if you're thinking, if you're uh, um, um, at a time in your life when you're thinking about having children. Um, and other symptomatic family members should be tested regardless of age if that is possible to do, if they have symptoms that are suggestive of this. The tricky part is when, you, when there are siblings that are asymptomatic, meaning that they don't have any weakness or other symptoms of the muscular dystrophy. Generally, they shouldn't have carrier testing in childhood because they're children, they're not able to legally make medical decisions for themselves. And it is consequential if they have uh, this kind of diagnosis that ends up in their medical record. So 
the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American College of Medical Genetics discourages routine testing of asymptomatic children. However, there are times when childhood complications can arise. So if there is a consequence for the child, meaning that a positive result may make them at risk and they might need, for example, cardiac screening, then they should have testing. So everything, go, everything depends on the clinical context and what the implications are for the child. And unfortunately, sometimes you have a genetic test and it's inconclusive or negative. And, and that's a frustrating situation that a lot of people face. Possibility one is that you might still have limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Remember, a negative test result does not mean you don't have limb girdle. So if you had a targeted sequence capture panel, you could consider asking about exome sequencing. That's a little bit broader and there's a chance something will be found on that that wasn't found on the original test. The other possibility is you might not have limb girdle dystrophy. You might have spinal muscular atrophy or Pompeii disease, one of those other diseases I mentioned. So that's where going back and thinking about other diagnostic tests can be very helpful. If you've not had them all before, that's a good time to go and think about that. There are other genetic tests available, microarrays, other panels for other categories of disease that may come into play. And then new information can become available, including publications. There are new papers that come out all the time, uh, both clinical reports and scientific studies. Uh, I've noticed in papers, there is a gap in mutation modeling in limb girdle muscular dystrophy, meaning that we haven't created enough models of disease that mimic specific mutations. So hopefully that'll change in the future. Ongoing research is key. My laboratory does uh, research on undiagnosed uh, patients with limb girdle dystrophy. It's worth considering participation in research studies. It's uh, a lot of times uh, uh, di expectations are a little different. You may not get a result for years or ever at all, depending on the specific situation, but once in a while you do get uh, some information you might not have been able to get elsewhere. In rare cases, as a result of research, genetic test reports may be amended in the future, and that's happened to me with my patients, where sometimes the test company will issue a, a revised report once they have more information based on publications. So, so, so that's also a possibility that may happen in the future for any individuals who've run into these negative test results. So, um, Dr. Munkel like will be presenting a follow-up talk in a few weeks, and I'll be happy to take any questions. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Kang. That was such a great presentation. And we've got some questions that were submitted by patients, and they actually submitted these um, over the last couple of weeks. And we also want to encourage anybody listening that if you have additional questions that you'd like answered, to send them over to us at Catherine at the speakfoundation.com. And then we will be able to forward them over to Peter and then he would be able to answer some of them. Um, we have some questions. Let me go first with this first question that was submitted. If a brother is diagnosed with limb girdle 2B, for example, and then they have a sibling who also suffers from the same disease, but has never been genetically tested. Should that brother with the symptoms go ahead and get the genetic test as well? And the question was, will that brother or sibling have the same mutation always, or can it change a little? One thing that I've discovered in genetics is um, I, I should always, um, I should avoid the terms always and never. And so, so it's, um, so what I would say is in a situation like that, um, in most cases, the brother will have the same mutation or mutations. Um, that being said, once in a while, something unusual happens. So if, um, if it's possible to get the genetic testing covered by your insurance, I think it is always worth uh, getting confirmation. And also as new molecular therapies uh, become available, a lot of them require genetic testing confirmation to be eligible for therapies as well as clinical trials. So even if you're, you, you're fairly certain that your sibling has the same thing, I think there are benefits to having the testing. That being said, um, if your insurance doesn't co cover it and it's very costly, um, I think if, you're, if it seems very likely your sibling has the same thing, you can sort of make that assumption for now and. Uh, for practical purposes and then defer the testing until it is covered. 
Okay, I want to ask a question in here too, just personally. Um, so a lot of times I'm getting uh, questions from individuals that live in countries that really don't have any genetic testing available. And so I wanted to see about one thing. Um, would you recommend that a wise course of action would be for someone to perhaps have a CK test done? Maybe they don't have genetic testing in their country, but they can get a CK test and that might indicate that they have some kind of um, neuromuscular condition. Um, I, I think a CK test is very helpful to send. Um, and, and yes, if resources are limited, then whatever diagnostic testing you can ha get access to um, is definitely potentially helpful. Um, the one thing to remember about CK levels for limb girdle dystrophy is that there are some subtypes that where you have a normal CK so if you have a normal CK, it doesn't completely exclude it, but if it's high, then that it does suggest that there, there might be a muscle disease going on. Okay, that's, that's good to know. All right, we have a, another question that came through. Um, I have limb girdle muscular dystrophy, but my siblings don't have any symptoms yet. And I think this goes back to something that you had already addressed a little bit, but should they be tested anyway, they are older. So they said they're, kind of like older, I'm assuming they're not children. So would you recommend testing in that case, even if they're not having any symptoms? So adult siblings, um, if they have no symptoms, um, one factor would be if they're planning to have children, they should consult with a genetic counselor um, and discuss with, um, with an OBGYN about, um, about the risks and benefits. So, uh, so for family planning purposes, it's, uh, it is very important to have uh, genetic testing done if you have a close uh, relative who has a genetic disease, and that I think goes in, uh, in general. Um, if there are potential health consequences um, that where you may have, for example, heart complications, if it goes undiagnosed, then that might be a reason to get tested. So it varies depending on the circumstances, but, um, but a lot of times it'll be for genetic counseling, family planning, or for potential implications for your health for adults. For children, it's a little different also. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, that's, that's good to know. And then um, we had this question, how many people percentage-wise do not receive a genetic diagnosis when they're tested? And I think you mentioned a little bit about this in your presentation already. So that one paper that was published in 2018 had a diagnosis rate of 27%. Um, and, and I'm sure the figure varies. And in our research lab, we get a slightly higher percentage, um, but, uh, but also that's variable depending on the group of patients you're looking at. So there are a significant number of patients who don't get a diagnosis. Now, I suspect some of the ones who don't get a diagnosis may have an alternate diagnosis, but a lot of them I think still do have limb girdle and we just haven't figured out the genetic mutations yet. And, and you know, I know that Monkle is gonna be talking a lot about that too next month. But so basically there are some limb girdle muscular dystrophies that haven't been discovered yet is basically what we pretty much know, but we're in the midst of trying to determine that, correct? Uh, yes, I, I suspect there are a number of new limb girdle genes that have not been discovered yet. And so, um, so my lab is looking into that. I think Dr. Lex's lab is looking into that. So uh, fortunately, there are several labs around the world that are uh, really actively interested in this. Yeah, that's good to know. And, you know, I've often said this, um, I think patients assume that if they're tested in one lab, that their information goes all over the world in some kind of database. And I'm not really sure that actually happens. So is it important for patients to be tested in multiple labs or do you think that just one lab's okay? So uh, I think health information systems are getting better at connecting with each other. I've noticed in my own practice that uh, there are times when I can access more and more from other centers, and I think that's good because that avoids unnecessary duplication of testing. Um, generally, you don't need to have the same exact genetic test more than once. However, if you have a muscular dystrophy panel that covers, say, 20 genes, and you had that done 10 years ago, um, nowadays a lot of muscular dystrophy panels have 100 genes on them. So 
if there is a clear difference in between what you had before and what's offered today, then it might be worth having that new test done. Okay, that's, that's important. And then what are the free resources in the United States that a patient can get tested? There are, uh, and this is a, a rotating roster of, of, of companies. Usually at any given time, there's at least one or two companies that offer free genetic testing for various muscular dystrophies and neuromuscular disorders. Um, and, and so, and for various reasons, the, um, the facilities tend to rotate every few years. So, um, so, uh, so if you ask your physician, and if your physician doesn't know, ask your physician to consult with specialists who might be more familiar with this. Um, they are out there um, and, uh, and they are accessible, at least in the United States. Okay, good. And then we had a question about um, genetic counseling. And are there any resources for free genetic counseling? And this individual said they lived outside of the US and it wasn't available in their country? It depends. So a lot of times when, um, when you see a genetic counselor, uh, sometimes it depends on the state. The rules vary from state to state. Some genetic counselors can practice a little more independently than in some states than others. Um, a lot of times you'll be seeing a genetic counselor in the context of a, a multidisciplinary clinic visit, either with a geneticist or a neurologist or some other specialist physician. Um, in terms of seeing a genetic counselor where it doesn't generate a charge, um, the most common setting for that is a research study. And uh, usually they're more focused on um, informed consent issues and, um, and conduct of the trial. But, um, but it, it, depending on the situation, they may be able to offer a little bit of advice as well. So, um, so research studies are sometimes a way to access genetic counselors, but they can't always give you clinical advice in that setting. So that's the downside of that. Okay. Yeah, I know that a lot of times patients will participate in research and they'll almost have an expectation to have maybe a sit down afterwards and something given to them and sometimes participation in research doesn't necessarily mean that, correct? Yes, it's, it's important for patients um, to ask questions when you're consenting for a study. And a lot of times research uh, projects, uh, and this is not because we're trying to be secretive, but um, there are a lot of rules that govern uh, research studies. And so we're actually not allowed to reveal a lot of information back to the participants. So if you are hoping for some information back, you should ask. And I certainly try to give back as much information as I can, but I, I and many and most other researchers are subject to a fair number of restrictions. Yeah, and I think it's important for people to know that because it's not that they're um, trying to keep information from them. It's just sort of the, the, the rules involved in doing research sometimes for researchers and um, I think it's important for people to know if they if they are participating in research sometimes that that can be the case. Um, so this question was presented that they had a VUS, a variant of unknown significance, and then they said, you know, what should I do at this point? Um, should I, you know, wait? What is there anything that you can recommend since they really don't have a firm diagnosis? What I do, I guess from my perspective, when I have a patient who has one of these variants of unknown significance, I, and I feel like I've, uh, I've kind of hit a wall, so to speak, um, I, I go back to the drawing board and I go back to the patient's original symptoms and I think, is this really the right diagnosis? Is it limb girdle muscular dystrophy? If it's a really convincing story for it, that means that I need to dig a little bit deeper and try to help the patient find other genetic testing resources or research uh, programs that can help. And, um, but if there's a possibility of an alternate diagnosis, then we may end up going in a different direction. So, um, so I know that that's a very frustrating situation. Um, so I'd recommend uh, to all the patients who are on the call, if you are in that situation, just ask your physician if they can just go back to the beginning and rethink your case and is, are there any other possibilities? Mm -hmm. Right, that's good. And in terms of 
someone who definitely has limb girdle type weakness, but they have a boost, what are the chances that there would be a treatment available for them in the future? I think the future is very bright, and that's one of the reasons why it's important to get a genetic uh, confirmation uh, of, of what's going on. So um, there's nothing approved by the FDA yet that alters the natural history of, of limb girdle muscular dystrophy, but there are clinical trials going on uh, right now as we speak, and there are uh, you know over 30 different types of limb girdle muscular dystrophy, so it's going to be a process, but it's, it's a very... Um, it's a very hopeful sign that there are clinical trials going on for this and the treatments are fairly sophisticated. So that's very exciting. I can't really um, predict the timeline, but, um, but hopefully it won't be too long before things get more serious and moving closer towards approval. That's good, that's good. And then um, someone else had presented this question um, that they had limb girdle weakness and they said, well, their report didn't really say that they had anything. And they said, I know something is wrong with me. I think what they're going back to, similar to the other question, is that they're having weakness. They know something's wrong. And I think there's a lot of implications for a person in this situation, I would say, Dr. King, because they're, they're having problems, but you know they can't really definitively say that's their disease. But you had said, it doesn't mean they don't have it. Um, you know, I think this person's question really was referring to like, how do you just, how do you explain this to family members? How do you explain this in terms of like, what is wrong with you? And I think that that's difficult for a patient, but they said, what should they do? And I think that's what they're talking about. Like, how should they describe their disease if they can't really say that they have a particular thing yet? So what I, um, what I try to explain to my patients is I try to give them the most specific diagnosis that I'm confident of. So if I have a patient who has negative genetic testing, there's nothing that shows up, yet they've had a muscle biopsy that clearly shows a muscular dystrophy, what I'll tell them is, I'm confident you have a muscular dystrophy, your muscle biopsy shows it, so you should tell anybody you want to tell that that's your diagnosis. I just can't tell you what subtype you have yet. And, and we'll keep looking. So, um, so uh, just ask your doctor to be as specific as possible about what diagnosis he or she thinks is, um, is appropriate for you. That's really wonderful advice there. You know, I wanted to just share, I, I grew up in uh, Richmond, Virginia, and my doctor was one of the best neurologists, and his name is Dr. Robert Leshner. And I'm sure a lot of people have heard of him and I grew up with him as my neurologist. I was very fortunate. And I, I think we did, I don't know how many muscle biopsies. <laughs> I mean, I've got scars all over my leg. And I would say, oh, Dr. Leshner, another one? You know, it, but he was rigorous trying to determine what was wrong. And for years, I mean, I went and there was no, and I went to great neurologists um, at Emory in Dallas at UVA where I went to college and, um, you know, when I got over age 18, you know, and I started going, uh, moving to different states and, um, and, you know, it was still no answers for years. And then, um, strangely enough, I ended up at Strong Memorial Hospital and Dr. Robbie Tawil saw me hmm. and he said, well, I know what you've got. I'm 95% sure. Oh, and cool. I thought, yeah, right. <laughs> okay. I've heard this before. And strangely enough, um, district lichenopathy, FKRP or 2I had just been uh, discovered in the last year. And so when I had my genetic test done, they discovered I had 2I. Now, I honestly had such a bad attitude about going and getting another genetic test that I would have not known. So I just want to say people don't give up because I think I went, that was 25 years of me because I was, I knew I had something at age six, looking and looking and looking and being very rigorous going all the time. And sometimes you can lose hope. And I just want to say, you know, don't lose hope because something can be discovered and, you know, don't, don't miss out on finding it. You know, you, you might be one of those ones like I was. So, well, I want to say thank you so much, Dr. King for what you shared today. I mean, this is such important information and
thank you so much for being willing to do some follow-up questions. I know we may have some as submitted and um, we're excited to be able to help. And I wanted to also share, thank you. I know you had mentioned that we were acknowledged in the neurology journal for uh, helping with some of the COVID-19 work. So I want to say thank you so much for that acknowledgement in the journal. And I think it is supposed to come out like in paper form or something. So thank you so much for that. You're welcome. Thank you for the invitation. It was a real pleasure to speak today. Oh, thank you so much. And bye everyone. And thank you so much for being with us. This actual webinar will also be published on all of our platforms next week. And we have a YouTube channel and we will have a repository of Limb Girdle webinars over the next few years. Also, you can access our National Limb Girdle Muscular Dystrophy Conference there. And then next year when we do our 2021 Limb Girdle Muscular Dystrophy Conference, you'll be able to access those conference sessions there too. So our hope is that people will have a place where they can go and watch webinars where they can become educated on some of the more, uh, I would say more difficult aspects of Limb Girdle and the more technical challenges. So thank you so much, Dr. King, and we'll see everyone next month with Monk Have a great night and God bless.